Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Geological Society and to this, the second public lecture uh, of 2018, which we have designated our Year of Resources, which is relevant to this afternoon's topic. Today's lecture is entitled Close to the Edge, Approaching New Frontiers for Mineral and Metal Resources. And it's a great pleasure to introduce our speaker this afternoon, Andrew Bloodworth, who is the British Geological <coughs> Survey's Science Director for Minerals and Waste. Now, throughout human history, mining of minerals and metals has taken place at geographical and technological frontiers, close to the limit of what is possible. Unprecedented material demand has had strong correlation with human-induced environmental change, which we're really only just beginning to understand in its complexity. And as we face new demands and changing demand for minerals in the future, we've got a series of questions and challenges facing us. Are these moves towards new, front, new, re, new resource frontiers pushing us towards the edge, to the environmental limits of our planet? Or do some directions offer the possibility of a more sustainable future? As BGS Science Director for Minerals and Waste, Andrew Bloodworth is responsible for all BGS research relating to mineral resources and the geological disposal of nuclear waste. Andrew's own research, own interests include resource security, mineral, uh, critical minerals, and the impact of mining on the developing world. He has worked extensively in Africa and was formerly mining advisor to the UK Department for International Development. Andrew has been a fellow of this society for over 20 years, and he is a chartered geologist. He is also an associate member of the Royal Town Planning Institute, a member of the UK Minerals Forum, the Confederation of British Industry Minerals Group, and the, minerals, the Mineral Resources Expert Group of Eurogeo Surveys. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Andrew Bloodworth. Hello. Thank you, Nick. That was a very nice introduction. Um, Sorry about all the long kind of words there. but yeah. um, So, here we are, a horrible wet afternoon in London in February. Um, I'm going to take you for a trip around the world, I hope, and to some warmer places and some colder places and some rather inhospitable places. But um, So, I'd like to thank the Society for asking me to do this. It's, it's a great honour, actually. I feel very privileged to do this. A little nervous, so bear with me. Um, and I, I just, I suppose I have to say that some of the views I'm expressing are my own views, all right? So, let's go. Um, so, back in July 2016, this ship, the James Cook, the Royal Research Vessel uh, James Cook, was docked in Ponta Delgada in the Azores, in the middle of the Atlantic. And she was on a mission to go here. <laughs> uh, to do mineral exploration. Um, and this is where she was going. She was going to a, a part of the mid-Atlantic called, uh, mid-Atlantic seabed called the Tag Hydrothermal Field. And those of you who know a bit about plate tectonics know that what you can see down the middle of the Atlantic there, marked in that sort of brownie color is the mid-Atlantic ridge, which is an active zone of crustal spreading. Um, what she was actually targeting was this area. This is a very small area. That, that's only about 500 metres by 500 metres, that square. And that's the seabed. It's a bathymetric map of the seabed mapped by multi-beam SOMAR on that ship and on some uh, UAV submersibles that they had on the ship. And they were actually targeting... This is where I see for the laser pointer work. They were actually targeting this topographic high on the seabed called the Rona Mound. Now, the sharp eye of you will be able to see the contours here. These are depth contours, water depth contours. These are, this is a very deep part of the ocean. This is three and a half kilometers down. So 3,500 meters down. And that, we were actually targeting that because it's a, an inactive hydrothermal mound. There's nothing actually going on there. It's, 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 it's now uh, extinct, as it were. So what were we doing there? Well, we were sending a drilling rig down there. So this is BGS's um, lander remotely operated robotic drilling rig. Anybody who's worked with drillers will know it's a great thing having a robotic drilling rig. Um, 
So this guy has feet and it dangles off the end of a very, very long cable and it drills holes up to 50 metres deep in the seabed. So um, off we went looking for somewhere to land this on the Rona Mound. Now, this is, they always say never work with children, animals or video in PowerPoint presentations. So here goes. We tried it earlier and it worked. This is the topography of the Rona Mound. And you can see what an alien environment is. I'm sorry it's not exactly Blue Planet. but <laughs> um, This was shot from one of our UAVs um, on the seabed. And you can see the topography is very, very difficult. And therein lied a, a massive challenge for us. So that, that's the seabed. So we then had to send the little submarine down to look for somewhere for, for the, our big rig to land that was reasonably flat. And this is what they found. And you can see the light in the sort of left centre of the image there. And just watch that. So there it is. And that was our target. And you could just see what a really difficult alien environment is. And that, that white material looks like snow is, is, is the sediment that lands on the seabed. It's extremely soft and it's extremely difficult to land our, drilling, our heavy drilling rig on it. So they dangled this drilling rig off this three and a half kilometre long cable and after about, and it literally took them about two weeks to get it to land properly. Very, very difficult. It can't manoeuvre itself. It has, you have to manoeuvre it by manoeuvring the ship. And every time you move, my colleagues tell me that it takes about ten minutes for that movement to be translated at, at, at the actual drilling rig. Anyway, eventually they did manage to land it and they drilled and the image isn't particularly brilliant here but this is what they found. Here's the Here's a log of the core, and it's a series of uh, sediment, oceanic sediments, and then uh, the sulfide material that comes out of these hydrothermal vents. And what we were interested in, for those of you who want to come down afterwards, there's a piece of it. Um, this is a, a kind of mishmash of pyrite and chalcopyrite. So it's, it, it's got copper in it, it's got some gold in it, and... That's what we were interested in. We're interested in the geology, the, if you like, the ore deposit geology of the Rona Mound. But it, what I'm starting the lecture, a uh, lecture about front is, is just how difficult this is to do. It's really difficult, really, really challenging in these water depths at those water pressures and given the submarine topography they had to deal with as well. So that's just by way of introduction. So what's driving us to these frontiers, these, these frontiers I'm going to talk about, like the middle of the Atlantic and, and elsewhere? Here's, um, those of you watching the news last week, this is Elon Musk's dummy sitting in his old Tesla Roadster that he launched on top of his Falcon Heavy rocket last night towards the asteroid, but asteroid belt. I think don't panic, it's quite apt really. Anyway, here we go. Um, what's driving it? Well... The biggest thing driving it is um, global population growth. There's 6.57 billion people on the planet at the moment. There's going to be nine, over 9 billion of us by 2050. Things start to level off then. If you look at all the UN projections for population, looks like by the middle, by, by towards the end of this century, global population will be starting to level off around 9, 10 billion. But that, a lot of that population growth, or most of that population growth, is in the developing world. And people want to live like we do, unsurprisingly. So they want to live in cities. And they want to have all the stuff that we have. They want the vehicles, they want the devices, they want the energy access, everything else that we want. Cities consume a huge amount of metal and minerals. And they're the thing that really drive growth in our, our, our use of metal and materials, metals and minerals. And if you look at some of the figures for China, they're just sky high in terms of uh, 221... China will have 221 cities with more than 1 million people by 2025. That's 50,000 tower blocks, all the steel, all the copper, all the aluminium that goes into those. 
But there are other things as well. Um, cars. Cars are a big consumer of materials. And I just use this by way of illustration to what's happening out in the world in terms of material demand. There are a billion cars in the world um, and we're manufacturing maybe 35, 40 million vehicles a year. Um, only one in 16 people in China own a car. Three in four people in the US own a car. Between 2000 and 2010, car ownership in China increased 20-fold. And by 2030, there'll be more cars in China than were in the whole world in 2000. Cars use a lot of materials. Other things are changing. We now live on planet mobile. These things have a sort of magical appeal to us. Billions and billions. Of them. There are more mobiles on the planet than there are us now. And again, by way of illustration, this was a photograph of Pope Benedict's inauguration in 2005. Just to take a look. This was a photograph of Pope Francis' inauguration in 2013. <laughs> Everybody has one, and most of us have more than one. My daughter thinks getting a new one of these every 18 months is a human right. and they consume a lot of materials. The other thing, perhaps slightly more seriously, is we've got to clean up our act, particularly with regard to energy transformation. And we've got to move to a much lower carbon economy, and that drive towards clean energy and clean transport is driving interest in a whole bunch of, of new materials. This, gra this diagram just shows, you know, there's, there's been certain metals we've been using for literally thousands of years, like iron, copper, etc. And through the Industrial Revolution and the Automotive Revolution, uh, the Industrial Revolution in the 1800s and the Automotive Revolution in the 1900s, that palette of metals increased. But with the digital revolution, but particularly with the move to clean energy and renewables where we need wind turbines, we need photovoltaics, we need geothermal, we need nuclear. The palette of materials we're using is grown and grown, and we've got, gone from using very little of the periodic table to these days using most of it. That presents a challenge for the, for, for the mining sector and for the exploration sector. And that's pushing us to frontiers as well. We also produce a lot of these things, but in lots of different quantities. So you could fit all the rhenium produced in the world into this room quite easily. Last, you know, all the rhenium produced last year in the world into this room quite easily. You, it's quite hard to make a jet engine without rhenium, though. Um, but you certainly could fit all the iron ore. 4.5 4 billion tonnes of iron ore produced annually now. These are big numbers. This is a lot of material. Mining is a major human activity. We've been doing it for a long time, and we do it on an absolutely colossal scale. And that's one of the things I want to get across to you today, if I've got time. But I'm from Yorkshire, so I'm interested in money. And um, what you have to, and, and I want you to have this at the back of your mind for almost everything I'm saying today. This is what is at the back of everything. Money drives everything. Economics drive everything. The only reason we... Mining companies are not in business to mine minerals, they're in business to make money. So if they're not making money, they're not mining. Well, some of them mine and don't make very much money, but there you go. So this is all driven, and all that demand translates itself into, you know, the supply and demand curve, and, 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 it, and it translates itself into prices. Prices go up, prices go down. But in general, if you, if you plot these things... Prices over very long. This is aggregated metal prices produced by my colleagues in Germany um, over the last 20 years or so. Um, prices go up and down, and, and that drives the cyclicity in the business. Um, but in general, it's quite remarkable how little prices go up in the long term. And, and if, you, if you think about the amount we're producing now compared to in the past, that's quite astonishing. It just shows how efficient 
the mining sector is at getting stuff out of the ground. So behind that money, that money and that, that, that economic imperative drives science and innovation. And, it, and it's done this for a long time. It's done this at least since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. So our forebears in the Industrial in the, in the, the Great Enlightenment in the 18th century and into the 19th century, William Smith, a, it's out there in the, in, the, in, the, in the entrance hall there, the William Smith map, that was really driven by the need for resources, the need for those industrialists at the, in the early part of the 19th century to find the coal and the limestone and the iron ore that they needed to drive the Industrial Revolution. The invention of the steam engine, probably the single most thing that's, that, that, that transformed the industry in, in, in the 18th and 19th century because it enabled us to access resources below the water table. The miner's lamp, which enabled coal to be mined and other minerals to be mined from gassy mines because we could detect the gas that was, and it, it didn't explode. And that brought about mining of base metals in Cornwall. This is an old winding house, I think, at Zenner on the right down on the tip of Cornwall at Land's End. Um, and that massive revolution, you know, Cornwall, the UK was the world's largest copper producer it, up until the middle of the 19th century. And this is Big Pit at Blynavon in South Wales. Again, those, that pumping technology enabled large mines, like this was a big mine back in the day, uh, to, to mine coal and iron ore. This, this, this mine actually produced both coal and iron ore. Uh, and was smelted just down the road here in Blynavon in the big blast furnaces there. These were enabled by technology, particularly by pumping technology, and in this case, by the ability to work underground to see what you're doing without causing the gas in the mine to explode. So technology has always had an impact and always pushed us to go deeper into more hostile environments. So where are we going with all this? This is one of these ROVs that takes those lovely pictures down on the seabed. Well, it's changing the way we explore for minerals and metals. We have all sorts of techniques available to us now, like airborne geophysics, deep drill, deep drying and drilling. And I think the biggest thing the explorationists I know talk about is our ability now to crunch very, very large amounts of data. So these, these techniques generate vast amounts of data but we now have the computing power and the algorithms to, to help us interpret what those data mean. But possibly even more important is just our ability to scale now, that to, to, to go from using a lot of labor to becoming a very capital-intensive industry. So if you go to any of the big commercial mines now, particularly in the developing world, you see these things done on the absolutely vast scale. The, these trucks take 300 tonnes at a time. They're 10 times bigger than an articulated lorry can take. This is a, a ball mill, a grinding mill at Escondida in Chile, the big copper mine. And you can see, there's a, there's a man there. <laughs> this is big. This is really big. And it enables very large amounts of ore to be processed very optimally and very cheaply. And you have things like these amazing creatures, flexible conveyors, which you can use underground, which I, I can't work that out. How do you make a conveyor belt go around corners? But they do. Um, and these things, again, transform the way we mine. And then they've, th that, that economy of scale has, has enabled the industry to keep up with that unprecedented demand that we're seeing so far. The other big change, probably slightly less glamorous, but almost equally significant, is, is <coughs> logistics, global logistics. We have the means now to move vast amounts of material around the planet very cheaply. So 
massive, great, heavy trains moving iron ore or bulk. This is bauxite in Western Australia. This is iron ore in Western Australia. Big bulk carriers taking 300,000 tons of iron ore from, from Australia to steel mills in China, maybe. We're moving massive amounts of material around the planet. And it means that you could, again, optimize where production takes place, where smelting takes place, and really, really get benefit from those economies of scale. The other thing that's transformed the sector, particularly in the last 50 years, well, maybe even less than that, maybe the last 40 years, has been um, something you a lot of you may know, never have heard of, something called hydrometallurgy. This is the ability to extract metal not by smelting. So for 5,000 years since the dawn of the Bronze Age, we produce metal by pretty much the same way, which is smelting it using carbon and heat. This technology, solvent extraction, allows you to extract metal chemically from the ore. And it does two things. It really widens the base of resources that we can we can utilize this, for example, this, uh, this is a mine called Scorpion in southern Namibia. And this is an, it's a very high grade zinc ore body, but it's oxidized, which means it won't smelt thermodynamically. It's very difficult to smelt it. But this process allows, as was then, it's been sold on since that I was there, but, but Anglo at that time, to extract the zinc from it using um, chemical means. The other thing that this process allows you to do is to, because you end up with a, with a liquid that's full of the metal in solution, which you then electro-win, you, you recover the metal electrolytically. You're not, you're not putting heat in there, you're using an electrolytic way of recovering it. Means that, in theory, if you can find a zero carbon source of electricity, for the first time in history, we could produce metal without putting carbon into the atmosphere. And that's really, really significant. So hold that thought for later on. So what's, what effect have these technologies had? Well, we've gone really, really big. I mean, this is uh, Rossing uranium mine, in, again, in Namibia. Um, this is the largest hard rock uranium mine in the world. Uh, that's a very large drilling rig sitting in the bottom. This is big. This is a big hole. Um, so we've gone really, really big, and again, as I say, benefiting from those economies of scale, very efficient recovery of ore, but as you can see, possibly at some environmental cost. And that's an open pit, but again, technology is moving on, underground mining technology is coming, coming on again, and, and some operations now use this technique called block cave mining which somebody's described as an open pit underground, where you're, again, moving very large amounts of material from underneath rather than from on top. And that, again, is enabling certain, mi certain industry and certain mines to recover very, very large amounts of ore very efficiently and very cheaply. Inevitably, we're also going deeper. This, this is me and a bunch of my colleagues from BGS visiting Bulby Mine up in, uh, near Whitby in North Yorkshire. This is certainly the UK's deepest mine, and I think probably Western Europe's deepest mine now. Um, this is about 1.2 kilometers deep at its deepest point. It's quite hot down there. Um, and this is um, them cutting a new roadway there using, and th this again is significant. This guy is controlling this machine standing back from it, he's controlling it remotely. And then now there are even robotic machines which will do this. So we're going into very deep, difficult, dangerous environments using robotics and there'll be artificial intelligence, etc. Bear in mind though, this is Europe this is West maybe Western Europe's deepest mine at 1.2 kilometers. The deepest mines in the world are way over three kilometers deep. So much deeper than this. So we are going deeper. We have the technology to go deeper if we need to. Again, pushing those frontiers. Uh, this, I'll put this in. This is uh, Drakeland's mine down near Plymouth in Devon. This is a mine for tungsten. It's working a deposit. You, the, the, the pit is 
over here somewhere, but this is the processing plant. Um, this is where most mining is going on now. This is a deposit near to some old tin mines, near to some china clay mines on the edge of the Dartmoor granite. This is a deposit we've known about for maybe 130, 140 years, a long time. But nobody's ever been able to mine it because nobody's ever been able to make money. A bit, the jury's a bit out on whether these guys are making money yet, but they will at some point. But um, all this, what I've been talking about, the scale, the economies of scale, the ability to move large amounts of muck very cheaply, the ability to ch process material, the, the understanding of the extractive metallurgy of the material has, has transformed the way even we look at old deposits. And we're able now to, to basically look at old prospects in new ways. And, and Emmerden's a great, or Drakeland's is a great example of that, where there's a history of mining in this area, but here we are in the, late, in the early 2000s and we've got a brand new mine there. So it's not just about going out into green fields and finding other stuff. In fact, it's mostly about this. It's mostly about finding new mines in areas where there are old mines. So that's the conventional stuff. But I also wanted you to think about this in a slightly different way, the sort of other frontiers. What else is happening the edges of mining? Well, this is an activity that's happening on the edges of them. This is what we call, in my business, artisanal small-scale mining. This is mining of uh, a mineral called coltan, columbite tantalite. And if you have a mobile phone in your pocket, you have a little bit of tantalum in your pocket. And, and chances are about 25% of the world's tantalum comes from operations like this. This in the developing world where I spent a lot of my career is a major activity. There's probably 100 million people worldwide work, rely on this type of, not just coltan, but gold, coal, limestone, tungsten, tin, all sorts of things. Rely on this for a living. These, you don't meet any rich small scale miners, I can tell you, these guys are dirt poor. They're not doing this because they want to do it, they're doing it because they have to do it. And it goes on in almost every continent, but particularly in Africa, South America, and parts of South Asia. Um, it's mining a whole variety of materials, as I said. It comes with a whole bunch of issues around things like child labor, health and poor health and safety, poor environmental practice, and also, in certain parts of the world, quite strong links with uh, conflict. So the... the uh, war, civil, the horrible civil war that's been raging for 20 years in the DRC is mostly warlords fighting over resources mined by guys like this. So this is a major activity. If you have a mobile phone, chances are somebody like that is at the, end, at the other end of the chain. The other sort of frontier I want you to think about, this is my old office, uh, our office in <laughs> Kiva. That literally used to sit in there. Um, so this is what those of us in the business are starting to call the urban mine. This is uh, somewhere else we are definitely need to go and have to look for materials. So we've got to start thinking about how we recover the metals, the valuable materials from, this build, from buildings like this and from everything else that we use when it comes to the end of its life. And I'll talk quite a lot more about that towards the end of the talk. But you know, we can think about these things as an ore body. They have a lot of metal in them. Maybe, again, estimates vary, but some, somewhere around 50 different elements from the periodic table in that, in that device. Mostly in the circuit board, but also in the SIM card, in the screen, in the chassis, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of different elements. So we need to start looking at these things. But it isn't straightforward, and I'll come back to that. So we talked probably about things we can, I mean, okay, on a big scale, but we can sort of relate to what we might be familiar with. But, I, but I, I wanted to sort of finish this segment by talking about some of the wilder shores, the places we may be going, we're starting to look at, and we've already touched on that with the deep ocean. 
But we, um, some people in the materials business are looking, you know, are not that worried about global warming because one thing that the shrinking of the polar, the, particularly the, <coughs> the uh, sea ice in the, in the Arctic Ocean means is there's more access to lots of land around the shores of the Arctic Ocean. And various people are looking at it. This is a map produced by our Nordic colleagues of mineral deposits around the Arctic Ocean. And in certain parts, notably Siberia and northern Canada, there are already mines. So this is Divik Diamond Mine, which is in the northern territory of Canada. None of them, I should call it now. But surprise, surprise, people also looking down in Antarctica. If you delve into the internet, you can find various estimates of what's down there. But it's currently under the protection of the Antarctic Treaty, but I think the Antarctic Treaty runs out in about another decade. Um, I'm sure it'll be renewed, but it's just to say Antarctica's a big landmass with a lot of varied geology on it, it, and there are quite a lot of mineral resources there. Whether they'll ever be worked is another thing. And so we go back to the ocean. So I talked at the beginning of the talk about our research work at the Tag Mound in the Central Atlantic, but it's important to say that we're already mining minerals from the ocean. So the UK actually is the world's largest producer of construction aggregates of sand and gravel from the seabed. We have a very large drilling, um, uh, sorry, very large dredging fleet. And chances are, if you've entered a newish building in central London recently, that will be uh, being made from marine aggregates, either from the North Sea or the English Channel. These are rather more glamorous uh, marine mining operations that are going on right now or about to start. This is um, a diamond mining dredger which operates off the western coast of South Africa and the, and the coast of Namibia, down on the southwest corner of Africa. And these are very, very sophisticated ships which are working in de water depths from 100 to 200 metres recovering diamond-rich gravels and then separating the diamonds. The companies like these because they're really, really secure ways of processing diamonds and recovering diamonds. So they don't lose much from them because um, everything's obviously on a ship. Very, very sophisticated. This picture is of a, uh, a, a miner, robotic miner that's been built by a company called... Nor well, it's, it's been built for a company like Nautilus, called Nautilus Minerals, who uh, have, a, have a, a, a mining license for, at a place called Solwara, which is just off the coast of Papua New Guinea. And they're working a similar type of deposit to the one we were looking at in the mid-Atlantic. It's, a, again, a volcanic massive sulphide deposit, which is very copper-rich, and this is the miner that's going to work on the sea bottom. The crucial difference between this prospect at Solwara near Papua New Guinea and the one we were looking at, it, this, is only, this is only in 1.5 kilometres of water depth, whereas we were looking at 3.5 kilometres of water depth. But they've got the money, and they are going to start producing from that, from that area. But it's on a limited scale. And the really crucial thing here, with all these operations, whether it's dredging for gravel, sand and gravel in the North Sea, or it's dredging for diamonds off the coast of Africa, or it's, dredging, or it's, it's mining volcanic massive sulphides off the coast of PNG, is the term off the coast. This is very close to land. All these operations are close to land. The, the operation you saw at the Tag Mound, the Azores are a long way from anywhere, and the, and that, the Tag Mound is five days sailing from, the, from the, that port in the Azores. So these are very, very geographically remote. This is some other work we're doing. Um, in the Atlantic, this is uh, an image of something called the Tropic Seamount. Um, this is, a, in effect, an underwater mountain, um, it's, or an underwater plateau. This is 
the, the flat area on the top is about the same size in area as the Isle of Wight. It's quite a big feature. And that's at about 1,000 metre water depth, and the abyssal plain around it is at about 4,000 4, metre water depth. Why are we interested in that? We're interested in it for this stuff, which is manganese, iron, cobalt, crust or nodules. And again, if you want to see a piece, there's some here. It looks, it's, it's, it's a rock I think looks most like a piece of chocolate I've ever seen. It looks look good enough to eat. Don't try it. Come and have a look afterwards. And this is our ROV collecting samples which it puts in this basket here. There's a sample in its hot little hand. And that's what it looks like. I put a picture of that on Twitter and somebody said it looks just like Rocky Road. Chocolate, you know. <laughs> So then, you know what Twitter's like, it just went mad. About, you know. um, the other thing about these iron, these iron manganese cobalt pavements and nodule fields are very, very extensive in the ocean. They're particularly extensive in the Indian Ocean, and in the, uh, um, but particularly in the, in the Pacific Ocean. And there's something called the claverton clipperton zone in... Um, in the, in the Pacific Ocean, which is covered in nodules made out of this stuff. And it's colossally big. It's huge. Uh, it has the same sort of area as the landmass of Asia. It's a massive area. But the other thing about these, particularly on the seamounts, is you get their very, very rich habitats. And this is this interesting-looking critter here is something called a Dumbo octopus, and you can see why. Uh, it's very cute. This is, the, this is my David Attenborough moment. <laughs> Savor it, because it's the only one you're going to get. Um, so, I mean, this in itself is a challenge, because all these, these are very rich in cobalt. Cobalt's the mineral, the metal to have at the moment. You can't make a lithium-ion battery easily without a cobalt anode. Everybody's looking for cobalt at the moment. But you can see the problem. This is a beautiful habitat. It's 1,000 metres down, but it's really beautiful. There's a lot of life down there. And of course, this is what you all came for, isn't it? Spaceships mining. Um, oh, there's so much out there on the internet about this. There's a lot in the scientific literature about this. It's, it's quite shocking. <laughs> um, so we have people talking about capturing asteroids and bringing them back and mining all the metal out of them. We also have people talking about landing on the moon or on Mars and using the local materials, if you like, to build either bases or bigger, better spaceships. And my personal view is we're a long way from this. And I think what you, if we do see any extraterrestrial mining, it won't be about bringing material back to Earth. It'll be much more like this, which is about using local materials to build safe, secure habitats for the, 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 the people who occupy these very early colonies on Mars. That seems much more plausible to me than, than, than mining and bringing it back to Earth. So this is a final segment. and, and I, So I use this kind of slightly apocalyptic title about being close to the edge. How close to the edge are we? Well, that's, that's metal production over the last 120 years, and you can just see how it's going up. It's, it's really shooting up. That, we can't carry on like that, can we? That's just not possible. So, are we going to run out? This is the question. I Probably by lay people this, and, and, and journalists and things, this is a question I'm asked more than any other. When are we going to run out of something? Well, I mean, my answer to that as a geoscientist, geoscientist is not in the foreseeable future. The Earth's crust is a big place. And we have literally only scratched the surface. So I'm not that concerned about physical exhaustion. It's a theoretical concept rather than a, a, a one that's foreseeable in the, in, the, in the next two or three hundred years, I think. That's not to say we shouldn't be worried about stuff, because we should. So the Earth is a big place. There's a lot of metal in it. But crucially, more and more, there's a huge amount of metal in our own environment. We, have, we generate colossal anthropogenic stocks of metal. 
They're not always that easy to access, but they are there and theoretically recoverable. So between the primary stocks in the crust, whether that crust is on land or beneath the ocean or whatever, and the secondary stocks in, that, that surrounds us, that we surrounded ourselves with, that's a lot of metal. And it's currently a lot of metal we're not really using. This is much more of an issue. It's just getting at it. People don't like mines. That's a big issue in the developed world. North America, Australia, Europe. You try and do anything around a hole in the ground and people don't want it. They don't like it. So that social acceptability thing, um, what sociologists call place protective action, what possibly you and I might call nimbyism. And there's, there's a social acceptability around people's environmental consciousness, you know, much more altruistic social acceptability around people's environmental consciousness about possibly mining in national parks. Or, you know, we talked earlier about the small-scale miners and how the links with conflict and poverty. So there's a sort of social accept altruism as well that, that I was talking to Nick earlier about ethical sourcing of material, you know, do you know where that material comes from? Blood diamonds, all that sort of thing. That all fits into that strand. And then there's other issues around international politics. For as long as human history, there have been, there's been conflict around resources. And, and jurisdictions, individuals, elites are not averse to using the, the, for have-not-haves to exert control over have-nots with regard to resources. So you get phenomena like resource nationalism and you get geopolitical issues. And they're really what cause problems in the short term with access to material. That, that's what sometimes causes problems. Sometimes they're real, sometimes they're perceived. So this is an example of that geopolitics. These are the Senkaku Islands in, in the Sea of Japan. And these are disputed territory between China and Japan. There's a Chi uh, Japanese Air Force plane flying over them. And six or seven years ago, there was a major spat between China and Japan over these islands. And, and all China did was threaten, just threaten, they never did anything, but they threatened to cut off rare earth supplies to the Japanese electronic industry. And that caused a massive panic around rare earths and where are we going to get rare earths from? Uh, so it's not, it's not just about what actually happens, it's what people think are going to happen. It's what people in the city call sentiment, isn't it? And similarly, this is an image from Eastern DRC, and these rather mean-looking guys with the big guns are Congolese militia who have been fighting over gold mines, diamond mines, coltan mines in Eastern DRC, and that's what that war has been fueled by. It's been, it's been financed by and motivated by resources. But this is what you should be worrying about. If you want to, you want to go away and worry about something, this, worry about this. So this is a um, picture of my friend Peter Scott, who is emeritus professor down at Campbell School of Mines. And this is the Carnan Valley, those of you who know West Cornwall, it's near Red Roof. And it was mined for copper and tin and arsenic back in the 18th and 19th century. And it's still bearing that very heavy environmental legacy from that. My industry has an appalling environmental record. And, and that lives long in the memory of people. And this is part of it. So, you know, that's even though the industry now operates to much higher standards, it, it, the, the, there is a massive legacy from mining in the past. And that Im impact on the planet manifests itself in a number of ways. We talked about contaminated land. It, it's an industry that uses a lot of water, and it's an industry that operates in places where water is already an issue, and it's an industry that uses a lot of water. So water is a big issue, for the, a big environmental issue for the, for, the, uh, for the industry. Where does the water that you need for your processing come from, and what do you do with the dirty stuff when you finish with it? It uses a huge amount of energy. Three to five percent of the total energy we use on this planet is just used to break rocks. So it's a big, big user of energy. How can we break rocks 
using less energy. There's a challenge. And we use a lot of energy and we emit a lot of carbon because of the chemistry of smelting. We need a lot of heat to smelt rock, to smelt ores, and fundamentally the chemistry of smelting needs carbon. So it emits carbon. I think I'm just about on time. So how do we pull ourselves back from all these, particularly these environmental issues that we're facing? We need to learn to manage water better, particularly in arid countries. And I think the industry are really, really taking that seriously. And, 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 and there's some, some very good practice examples of that. But it's not something that's going to go away. And it's something that doing more with less water and really, really conserving what water is used is really, really important. I mentioned this already. This is this decarbonisation of metal production. So this is an electro-winning plant from that solvent extraction plant in Namibia you saw earlier. It uses colossal amounts of electricity and it's really important to bear in mind at the moment that that electricity currently comes from a coal-fired power station in South Africa. So it's not low carbon electricity, it's quite high carbon electricity. But in theory that, could, that process could be completely decarbonised if you can find a lower, a lower carbon form of electricity. At the top, this is a, what they call a heat leach operation in, uh, in Chile to recover copper. And if you're very sharp eye, you can see that water is quite blue. It's because it's full of copper. And this uses microbial leaching to, to recover the copper from the ore. And again, it's a very low carbon way of getting that copper out of the ore. It's a very sort of benign way of... of, of... So there are technologies coming physical chemistry, organic chemistry, microbiology, which are offering us the possibility of decoupling our metal use from carbon in greenhouse gas emissions. We need to do more with this stuff. There's my office again. And you can see that the, the, the demolition uh, driver here has recovered... He's got all these little piles of material, and he was actually working... It was amazing to watch these guys, you know... Recovering the gird, the iron beams, recovering the aluminium window frames, recovering the copper wiring, and putting them all into separate places on the demolition site. But we, we do face a problem with this urban mine and with recovering metal from urban mines. And, it, and it's quite a fundamental problem, really, because we, when we make these things, or when we make steel alloys, and when we make... Um, aluminium alloys, we're often putting metals, different metals together in combinations that nature doesn't. And that makes, I'm no chemist or metallurgist, so you know, don't ask me any awkward questions, but I, I'm, this represents quite a fundamental thermodynamic problem. It's actually separating one phase from another is actually quite difficult. So this is a I, I tried to avoid having text slides, but I, I couldn't think of a better way of doing this. This is, this is what happens when you smelt a mobile phone. So the, in, in Antwerp, there's the world's largest mobile phone smelter, right? And what they're after there is the copper, and they're particularly after the precious metals that the copper brings out with it. And they recover that as a metallic phase, and that gets recycled, and everything's lovely. But because of the thermodynamics, because these incompatible metals are being put together... There's other metals, like the aluminium and the magnesium and the lithium and the rare earths and the tantalum, are all lost. They go into the slag phase. You can't recover them. You can't recover them economically. And that's a quote from Umicore, the company that operate this smelter, and that's what they say. Traces of metal oxide embedded in large volumes of slag are not economic to extract. So when you, when you send your mobile phone for recycling, bear in mind... Actually, not very much of the metal in that mobile phone is being recovered. It's not recoverable economically. It's, it's difficult to do. So, so there's a massive technical and scientific challenge there to, to actually improve that, improve, improve all sorts of things, which I'll come on to. So this is my sum up slide. Is there, is there a more sustainable future? Well, I thought about this, again, because I've got a bit of economics training. You know, what... what Think about this in demand and supply terms. So, oh, come back. 
Um, the demand is there. It's massive. We're going to have 9 billion people on the planet by 2050. So we need to start not just thinking about where supplies are going to come from, but another frontier for us is about how we manage demand. So how can we do more with less? How can we make this thing last longer? How can we make this thing last 20 years, not two years? Um, can we design this and vehicles and buildings for reuse, for remanufacture, and eventually for recycling? How can we better design them so we can separate out those, particularly the metals, from each other at the end of the product life? How do we meet the challenge of sourcing material ethically? How do you trace metal back through the supply chain? That's a real big challenge. I think there's some good news. I think in, in the Western industrial, post-industrial economies like ours and to a certain extent European economy, economies, there is some evidence that we're already, we've, we've kind of got to peak stuff. You know, that we're starting to decouple. In, up until now, there's been a very strong correlation between economic growth and the amount of stuff we use. And there's some evidence now that we're starting to decouple from that. And that, that's really good. I mean, we've got a long way to go, but... I think that's a kind of positive message about sustainability. And then we need to think about the supply side and just come back to that Yorkshire thing. It's all dictated by money. It's all dictated by economics. And actually, in this industry, also quite a lot by regulation. Regulation drives a lot of the way the industry behaves. But I think, when I was thinking about this, how do you sum up this? I think, I'm thinking, if you're talking about frontiers, you're really talking about what drives everything is the technology. The technology dictates where we can go. The di technology dictates whether we can go into the deep ocean. The technology will dictate whether we can go into space. The technology will di dictate whether we can recover more metal from these things. So for the time being, I think mostly what you're going to see is new mines on old prospects. You know, we're going to be going where we've always gone. But we'll also see that increase in that urban mining, increasing recovery of metal from our own environment. And I believe you put those two together and you need to start thinking about total resources. We need to think about so much at the moment is people talk about recycling or they talk about primary mining. And actually what we need to do is put all that together and think about it in one, one lot. It's all metal. And it's all, you know, we need to think about how we recover can one industry learn from another? I feel that the secondary sector, the recycling sector, has such a lot to learn from a very, very efficient global mining industry. But above all, because of this planetary limit thing, we need to think about this. We need to think about how can we get more with lower impact? We're going to need more. Whether we like it or not, there's going to be demand. So we need to reduce the impact of what we're doing on the planet, on people, on water, on habitats, but above all, on greenhouse gases. We've got to decouple our metal use from greenhouse gas emissions. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Andrew. Apart from that, I thought, fantastic overview of um, where our resources come from and what those frontiers look like. The thought that came through to me there was really this, this problem of people being so disconnected from the resources they use. We're all so unaware of, the, of where the resources we use come from. And if our year of resources can go anywhere towards sort of trying to remake that connection, uh, then I think that would be a really useful thing. And you got us off to a great start with that. So we've got a little bit of time for questions. There's a couple of microphones, so before you ask your questions, please wait for the mic to record you for posterity. Um, Naomi, can we start down here? There's a couple of questions either side of the aisle here. Thanks. That was fascinating. Do you need anybody's permission to start mining the seabed in the middle of the Atlantic? Yes. Yes, you do. Yes. There's, a, there's an organization that's part of the UN called the International Seabed Authority. They're based in Kingston, Jamaica, and they issue licenses in outside countries 
when, when you're outside the jurisdiction of, uh, of the economic, exclusive economic zone of a country, you, become, you come under the International Seabed Authority. So, yeah, you do need to buy a license from them, yes. Maybe there's a question just in front of you there, Naomi. Thank you. That, that was so interesting. I scribbled down as much as I could. Um, I became aware many years ago now of the concept of built-in obsolescence. Yes. And when my iron went recently, when my, I damaged the flex and I couldn't replace the flex, I had to ditch the whole iron. Is there any, uh, any sign of awareness in industry of making things more modular so that that sort of thing doesn't happen and of giving us back separate plugs so that things don't come with molded plugs yeah. that you, you know, mm. it's all, it's made to use as much as possible yeah. and tie you into spending as yeah. much as possible. I, I think uh, it's interesting, you're touching on an issue there which is, uh, I, again, it's not really my area but I know a little bit about it. Um, that one of the issues, uh, what, what you're really touching on is the, is the business model of the iron manufacturer. And the business model of the iron manufacturer is to sell you a new iron every five years. Um, not to sell you the service that the iron delivers. You know? So it may be, you know, in the past, I'm old enough to remember when you rented your TV, you know, um, and, and, and a man came and repaired it. But that's, that's the, sort of, the business model for that has sort of gone out of fashion. So there are quite a lot of people now looking back, they're going back, back to the future, if you like, looking at can we change the business model for domestic... I know there's schemes in, Euro, in, on, in continental Europe where you, for instance, rent a washing machine. You don't buy a washing machine. So you, you just buy the... You, in fact, you're renting the service that the washing machine delivers. Um, so people are thinking about that, and certain industries are already doing those things. But the problem, in, particularly in retail, in the consumer sector, what they call the consumer sector, people who sell you these things or your iron, they've, they've, they've completely detached themselves from that. I mean, what I would like to see is Apple making a phone that lasts 20 years, but the, the, what they sell you in the end is a service, because we all love these things, they do all sorts of things, they're fantastic. But what we're really interested in is the service. That what Apple have done, though, is they... I hope there's nobody from Apple in the audience. Um, <laughs> but um, is they made them a fashion item, you know. So my daughter, bless her, she wants a new one. Why are you still using that old phone, you know? Um, so I, I agree completely. I think it's a slow burn, this one. But there are people really thinking hard about this. I think the gentleman, in the, the gentleman in the middle definitely had his hand up with the dark. The and then we'll take the gentleman down towards the front, and then there's another one. Uh, what is your view on the prospect of being able to buy um, an ethically sourced mobile phone? Um, well, you can. There's something called a fair phone, which is... Um, I, I would love to have a fair phone, but our, our uh, work security policy doesn't allow me to use an Android phone. I have to use an Apple phone. Um, the uh, Fairphones, I believe, <laughs> claim to be completely ethically sourced material. So that's their aim. That's their aim. What is it? Sorry, I Nick. Nick knows more about this than I, I do. Think but that, uh, presently, the Fairphone is something like seventy percent of the materials in there are ethically sourced, and their aim is to do more. But even as a specialist company doing that, the only one in the world, they can't fully ethically Guaranteed. source their materials. In there. The reality is that, again, Nick and I were talking about this before the, the lecture that. Supply chains, for, for particularly for electronic products, are very long. So you may have, in between Apple selling me this phone and some guy sitting in a hole in the middle of Africa digging out tantalum, there may be six or seven different organiz separate organizations. So tracing that metal from that hole in the ground to this is, is very challenging, really, really difficult to do. And getting all the factors along that chain on board. Yes, yeah. So it, 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 I, I'm very, I, I, when I worked at the Department for International Development, I worked a lot on these, you know, the beginning of these ethical sourcing initiatives, and I'm quite sceptical about some of them. Um, 
they're, they're, particularly with metals, where it's very difficult. It's, it's easier. I think there are good examples of ethical sourcing. I think um, Forestry Stewart, Stewardship Council with wood products, for instance, do a fantastic job. Uh, but it's, it's kind of a piece of wood is a piece of wood, you know, um, whereas a few molecules of tantalum is harder to keep track of. As one of your predecessors who dealt with this question. Could you take the microphone, please, so that it's so that people can hear the question? As one of your predecessors who dealt with this question, as you were doing now, but a long time ago, I think retired now for 25 years. And it's interesting to see that the question is still there. Nothing changes, David. <laughs> Yeah. And this was regarded as quite a quite positive thing to yeah. economically. But it all failed on the political problem yeah. as to who actually owned these nodules. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, whether they should belong to the to the humanity as a whole, yes. how that might be managed. Yeah. Yeah. So a great deal of money was spent, but nothing was ever produced commercially because of that geopolitical yeah. problem. And it's interesting to see you Yeah, I think the those problems are still there. I understand. So there are still arguments about ownership uh, with those things. From I've got colleagues who've done a lot of work on these things now. What they tell me is that the technology exists to recover these things. In, but nobody's ever tried to bolt the whole system together, and. The big challenge, the, 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 aside from the ownership issues, the technical challenge, one is getting material from the seabed to, the, to a ship. And the, the systems exist to do that, but one of the issues they have is just generating the amount of energy to do that, which is quite considerable. And the other are very prosaic things like, how do you transfer a load of ore from one ship to another in the open ocean a very long way from anywhere? And... I don't think anyone's overcome that yet. You know, it, it, I think it's really telling that all the ocean mining we're doing at the moment across the world is all very close to land. None of it is, uh, and you know, the Atlantic's big enough, but you go into the Pacific, the distances are absolutely colossal. So you know, you're you're effectively you know having to move material half, literally half a world, and and. Yeah. Extraordinary uh, piece of technology with two ships with buckets moving between. Yeah. And the Castillo was very, yeah. very well. Yeah. I think we're I think we're personally, I think we're a long way from it. I don't think we're gonna see it any time soon. This is actually one of the metals you did not show in your in your uh, uh, projection is indium, which uh, is a very important material for mobile phones. Yeah, it is, yeah. I'd like to take one more question, if I can. Um, there were a couple of hands up towards the back. Oh, there's one to, over to your <coughs> left, Naomi. Thank you. On the energy <coughs> issue, uh, going back, looking at the uh, early drilling platforms, you found it. Uh, problem getting energy down to the uh, vehicle there. But in terms of jewels, has anybody costed how many more jewels are needed to extract the metals from the ocean floor to get them up to the surface before you even start cost processing them, let alone doing anything else compared to conventional mining on land? I'm sure they have. I, I mean, I, again, as I say, I'm quite a sceptic. I think it's going to take a long time. Uh, and there are all sorts of issues, uh, including the energy one. And as I say, in the end, it all comes down to money. And if you can mine it cheaper on land, you'll, people will mine it on land rather than in the deep ocean. Um, but the resources in the ocean are vast. 
they are absolutely huge. Uh, so at some point, someone is going to start. That's why we're doing the research. We're, not, we're, we're doing the research to look at what are the impacts going to be, basically. One, one more question, Naomi, sorry, right round on the other side, I'm afraid, and then we'll let Andrew off until he does this all again <laughs> at six o'clock. <laughs> Following on from that, uh, there are vast quantities of uh, minerals in the sea, but it's filled water. Yes. Uh, reverse osmosis concentrates it. Are there methods to use clever inorganic chemistry uh, uh, and bugs and everything else to extract metals from the sea? I think, I think there are... I, I, the only one I've heard of relatively recently is I think the in, the people, some people in India were looking at recovering thorium from the sea using uh, sort of plastics which you hang in the water and they absorb the, the thorium selectively. I think whatever you do, it needs to be very passive and very low energy. Otherwise, it, it just becomes because the concentrations are so low. But yeah, people. I know people have looked at seawater. I think you know you come again up to the, against the energy problem normally. That it's just again thermodynamically, it's very. It, 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 in theory, it's possible, but in practice, the amount of energy you require to do it is very large. Unless you can find some very passive way of doing it. As I said, I think we'll let Andrew off the hook again now. Let him have a rest before his <laughs> evening performance. But thank you for your question. Thank, thank you again, Andrew. Thank you.